just two weeks ago, one of my personal heroes and a longtime stalwart supporter of free press signed off from his weekly television show for the last time. Bill Moyers set the standard for in-depth, insightful television journalism. I don't really believe there's such a thing as truly objective journalism, and there's no question that Mr. Moyers had his opinions. But he was always fair, always accurate, and always informative. He was public media at its best. His departure definitely marks a turning point. The question is, which way are we turning? This is about more than who is going to replace Bill Moyers on Friday night. This is about whether Bill Moyers is truly the last of his kind or whether we can build on his example to reimagine our old public broadcasting system as a new public media system devoted to local news gathering and devoted to community service. There have been a number of major reports released since we gathered here last year, including perhaps most notably the Knight Commission's Informing Communities report, as well as one done by Columbia University, all pointing to public media as perhaps the best answer to our looming crisis in journalism. Uh, today at Free Press, we, we're hoping to add to some of that work and expand on the ideas that we first put forward last year in our Changing Media book. We got a new paper that we put out today, which hopefully all of you have in your packets. It's called New Public Media, A Plan for Action. Uh, you've already heard from a couple of the co-authors today. I did want to acknowledge uh, Candace Clement, who uh, really drove this project uh, and did a great job. So thanks to Candace. Uh, we're going to be talking a, a lot this afternoon about uh, new public media. And in this paper, we propose a series of policy, funding, and other reforms to address the daunting reality that there is just no longer enough private capital, whether in the form of advertising, subscriptions, or philanthropy, to support the depth and breadth of quality local, national, and international news that our communities need to participate in a 21st century democracy. I want to be clear that when I talk about public media, I'm not just talking about PBS and NPR. They're part of it. But we also need to be talking about community radio, about low-power FM stations, about public access cable channels, about non-commercial newsrooms based on the internet. They've got to be part of this conversation. They are certainly part of the answer. We believe that local news reporting really needs to become one of public media's top priorities. We believe that we need to redouble our resources accordingly. We need public media to help us put professional reporters, fact checkers, and editors back on the beat to keep a watchful eye on those in power and to keep track of those vital issues that most people can't follow on their own. And of course, we need to figure out how to pay for it. At a time when the need for public media couldn't be bigger, we're spending pocket change. At last count, in terms of federal money, we spend about $1.43 per person per year in federal money to support public media. If the United States spent the same per capita on public media and journalism subsidies as a country like Finland or like Denmark, who are the world leaders, we'd be spending close to $100 per person. That would amount to $30 billion a year on public media. It's no coincidence that uh, all of the countries that rank at the top of The Economist magazine, uh, not exactly a liberal publication, maybe classically liberal, The Economist magazine's annual democracy index, which evaluates nations on the basis of civil liberties and functioning government and civic participation, all the countries that rank at the top heavily subsidize public media. And on that list, the United States ranks 18th. We're never going to spend as much money as those countries, but I'd like us to imagine for just a second how the public media system could dramatically increase its reach and its relevance if we were spending, say, $5 per person on public media. If we want to get there, just to five bucks for public media, we need to start rethinking how we fund it. We're going to need to build a public media trust that is seated with a substantial endowment. But if we invest in that kind of trust, eventually the public media system could become nearly or completely self-sufficient. In the paper we released today, we put forward a couple of different ways we could support such a trust fund. These include, perhaps, charging fees to broadcasters for their use of the public airwaves. Or alternatively, we could auction off spectrum to support better public media. 
Or we could place a tiny tax on advertising, or even change the way that advertising is treated in the tax code to support the greater good. Another idea, we could institute a small assessment on these uh, consumer electronic devices that could go to support public media. Any of these plans over the next decade could put tens of billions of dollars into a trust fund. That would allow us to have uh, annual appropriations significantly higher than we have today. And we could spend that money on local journalism, on investigative journalism, on arts and culture programming, and on education. Of course, all of these plans that we talk about would also require other changes to prevent undue political influence in public media content and to ensure that our public media system is well run, that it's more diverse, and that it is worthy of all of this increased support. This could include changes, or should include changes, to the makeup of the Co Corporation for Public Broadcasting Board and how it is appointed. We need to look at strengthening the role of ombudsman. We need to create higher benchmarks for local station performance and increase the diversity of staff, content, and audience. Any of these changes, or perhaps the better ideas that are still out there, uh, some of which I hope we'll hear about this afternoon, will also require, importantly, building, truly building, a national constituency to move Capitol Hill and state houses to implement the right, tr the right policies to support public media in its many, many forms. And that is going to mean, first and foremost, getting outside the beltway and actually engaging with local communities. We're at a moment where we really must move from media that, is born in, that was born in an era of information scarcity to media that contribute credible and quality programming in a world of information overload. Last year at this event, Commissioner Michael Copps called for the creation of a PBSS, a public broadcasting system on steroids. He reminded us, and I think it bears repeating, that this cannot be done on the cheap. As he said, other nations have found ways to support such things, and the point is that we need to start talking and start planning now. So we have a very exciting panel uh, who are about to join us here on the stage, currently on my left, soon to be on my right. They're going to share their ideas about the future of public media, public media's role in providing quality journalism, the shortcomings of the current system, and what we might learn from the rest of the world, including the BBC. And here they come. I'm going to leave things in the hands of Fry Chidea. Fry is a multimedia journalist, a strategist, and a novelist. She has extensive public media experience, including several years as the host of NPR's News and Notes, and is a contributor to WNYC's The Takeaway. She is about to unveil, and maybe even up today, I don't know, she's about to unveil a revamped version of her website, Pop and Politics. And you're gonna, if you like that, you're going to love this because she is about to, uh, she's in development on a new show, Pop and Politics Radio, which I trust she'll tell us about as well. And she's, I'm going to let her introduce our other panelists. Over to you, right? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I think that um, if, if something that one of us says doesn't piss somebody off, we haven't done our job. So yeah. are, are okay. we all on the same page on okay. that? We're on. We didn't do a lot of extensive prep, but we're <laughs> hoping to get under your skin a little bit. So um, I, I won't bore you right now with my new project, but I will bore you. Um, but right now, let me introduce the gentleman uh, to my immediately uh, immediate left. We've got David Fanning. He is the executive producer of Frontline, which um, you know you have been the executive producer of Frontline since there was a Frontline, <laughs> in, starting in 1983, yeah. and now you have this incredibly powerful multimedia engine, not just Frontline, but also Frontline World and all of your digital content. I want to talk about kind of your, your big picture of what you do, but also your big picture of public media. And then to your left, we have John Tate, who's the Director of Policy and Strategy at the BBC. Um, that deals with the regulatory relationships, including the BBC Trust and Ofcom. And one of the things I was interested in, um, and I, of course I want to talk about the UK elections, but I saw the piece that you did 
why the BBC must focus on quality content, and you did a bit of a comparative analysis of um, UK public broadcasting, European broadcasting, and American broadcasting. So I want to dig into that as well. Um, but let's let's start out with those elections. Um, <laughs> I was I was glued. Um, I, I was um, online watching your your channel that was just the elections channel online. And one of the things I've been impressed with is how the BBC can segment um, different news events, have different live feeds. You have, of course, many, many different languages that BBC content exists in, many more languages than, than content in the United States. Um, you're also facing budgetary concerns, as everyone is, and in that blog post, we, you talked a bit about the need to set aside some money for content. So how do you deal with the fiscal realities? I mean, talk, uh, feel free to, to weave the election in or to treat them as two separate topics, but I want to know a little bit about you know, how the BBC approaches uh, something like this historic election, and then also how do you deal with the budgetary concerns of delivering the news? Sure, and just before I do, just to say how wonderful it is to be uh, amid such illustrious company, uh, David, and I think with, with lawmakers of the quality of, of Byron, I think public media is set for a pretty fair course in this country, so really pleased to be here. Uh, in terms of the BBC's coverage, I think the, um, essentially, the breadth and depth uh, of coverage by the BBC of the domestic election is seen as part of the lifeblood of, of democracy in, in Britain. I think commercial models would not support the breadth, the depth, the forensic uh, fact-checking, the scrutiny level that we bring to bear on it. And I think what you've seen for all of the promise of digital media to democratize voice and, and pluralize voice, I think you may have seen a flowering of individual pluralism, but I think collective effective pluralism hasn't really come to pass. And the, and the concentration back into uh, you know, commercial vested interests or otherwise has been a, a marked feature of, of the maturing digital landscape in, in Britain and, and, and to some extent in Europe and around the world. So I think the BBC is a, is a powerful break on that, and we create a vibrant, I think, rich public space in the UK for people to reflect on politics and civil society in general without ads, with a high degree of um, uh, scrutiny and accuracy, triple checking, all of that. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a social choice that that be in place, really. It's, uh, it's quite, a, it's quite a, a, a deep social choice for that to happen. And for all of you might talk about the mechanics of how it's funded, and that's very important, and we're very lucky, uh, I think underlying it is a very profound uh, question of civil society and public choice, which needs to be engaged with as well. But yeah, the, the election is a huge event for us, uh, and it's it's um, it's uh, a really exciting election to be covering. You know, one thing that that strikes me is that when people, uh, I mean, there are obviously many different news sources in the UK, but the BBC is is huge, and it is public, or at least partially publicly. You know, I mean, it's publicly driven, publicly funded. Um, in the U.S., it's hard to imagine public media having the same amount of mind share when it comes to something like an election, because, in part, because of the nature of funding for public media. So, so David, when you try to do high impact media, and Frontline does do high impact media, how do you choose, given the resources you have, which are much more considerable than a lot of people in public media, but not unlimited, how do you choose how to use those resources? Um, well, that's, you know, that's a very hard question to answer because it is uh, such a, a complex piece of alchemy, the business of how you choose program, you know, what subjects you and choose and how you do it. Um, it is uh, the burden on Frontline is frankly that we have so many agendas that we shouldn't feel like we could be filling, which is that there are so many stories that we need to do, so few hours to do them in, um, the kinds of um, uh, 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 choices between national and international. We did um, some eight years ago expand Frontline to Frontline World uh, to do it at the beginning um, about four or five additional programs a year to do multi-part shorter stories uh, built on the premise that there was a new generation of younger producers and reporters wielding these new digital tools and that we should encourage them to go out into the world and with a little bit of funding that we got from the outside give them the, the plane ticket to go to Sri Lanka and say come back with something and if it's good enough we'll try to figure out how to get it on the air or on the web. And, um, and that, was a, that was a commitment to saying we just can't begin 
to do enough of these stories in the in the s in the hours of frontline that are sprinkled through the uh, the television schedule. It is a burden because uh, there is so much potential and so much that needs to be done, and uh, there is so little competition for this kind of work that it's it's it 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 is um, it animates us and at the times depresses us because we look around at our colleagues and frankly I look at the co my colleagues around public broadcasting, public television in particular, and look at the amount of money that is buried in the institutions around the country and think we're not using them as well as we should. I think the system in large part is more moribund. I think we don't begin to harness the kinds of uh, capital we have not necessarily in public television, but surrounding public television, in the communities and in the neighborhoods and in the uh, educational institutions, very often that house those public television stations, there is a lack of real um, enterprise in the system. And I think that lies at the heart of a, of a huge conundrum in the heart of public, the public media debate. I, uh, I'm here because Josh invited me and I admire very much um, this organization and think that the work it's doing is enormously important and I admire all of you, many of you in, in smaller organizations struggling to keep the public voice, uh, to get the public voice out. But my interest is in public television. I am a child of television, public television. I came in 1973 into a small public television station and, and, and there was a camera and, I, and there was some rolls of film and you know, a roll of film, 400 foot roll of film was enormously valuable. If you could put it into that eclair camera and go out and shoot with it, the things you could do. And uh, now the tools are so available and uh, out there all the time. And, and those public television stations in the early days, they were full of enterprise, full of young people who did lots of interesting things. And I'm now on the soapbox, I've got to watch out. I'll, just, I'll calm down a little bit. But um, we have lost something over the years in our institution as it's become more and more calcified. And we have lost, I think, um, the, the possibilities uh, to, well, the possibilities are there, but we've, 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 we've lost the energy to uh, encourage um, a real journalistic enterprise in public television. And I think that's something that we have to um, try to um, reorganize around as a, as, a, as a central heart of, I think, our mission in public television. Well, let, me, let me drill down a little bit, because if I understand correctly, based on um, you know, some of the comments that, that I've read that you've made, you don't like a sort of uh, fund drive based approach. Uh, pledge. Yes, Who you don't like pledge. pledge. All of you, you love don't pledge. like pledge. You don't like. It depends what you're pledging around, actually. Okay. I don't mind pledge. I think pledge, I think public radio does a fairly good job. They pledge around their content. What public television does is it pledges against content. Well, a schizophrenic life. You know, you're going to pledge around, uh, around uh, um, Suze Orman or whoever else you've got up there. Or I mean, I walked into a public television. You mean the personality driven? The personality driven, the sort of people, you know, the sort call of us right snake now. oil salesmen or whatever else are up there that we're, that we're pledging around, um, which has nothing to do with the rest of our broadcast schedule. I think this is a, I think it's shameful. Okay. See, I told you. Um, uh, and do you think that you are part of the problem? When it, and, and <laughs> don't you love that? Uh, when it comes to, you, you talked about the, the majesty of film, actual film, and I believe that film is majestic, but now people are shooting on their cell phones, and I it's realize. never going to look the same. You're down with that. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, the tools are extraordinary. I think it's the most, I, uh, Jose said it, I think it's the most extraordinary time to be a journalist. I think it's wonderful to be a journalist. You're not going to get paid anything, but you never were anyway. <laughs> By the way, when Peter McGee hired me at WGBH, he said being a documentary filmmaker is like taking the cloth. You know, just be prepared for the day. You will never make a living at this, really. But it's a wonderful time to be a journalist. The tools are spectacular. But can I just say something in parenthesis? Yes. I think that I don't blame those public television stations who put those pledges on because those dollars are enormously important for them. They really need the dollars. They need the membership dollars. They're locked into a particular ecosystem now of pledge programming on which they're deeply dependent. So I understand and I'm sympathetic to them. I think that changing that though requires that we change 
the ecology of the programming, which means that we actually have to raise the standards of the programming. Because if we infused the system with really first-rate journalism on a very grand level, and journalism is not just eat your spinach journalism, but the kinds of intelligent, smart, provocative programming that we should have on public television, the pledges will come. And but the pledges will be matched for them. Yeah, let me get John in here. Um, one, one completely obvious issue is that there's more content than ever in the world. Uh, some of it's useful, some of it's not. Some of it's highbrow, some of it's trashy. But there's vast volumes of content, some of which never will see a television, even though it is video content. How does the BBC and how should the BBC deal with vast volumes of content, both generated in-house and the synergies you create in-house, and also how do you view your relationship to third-party content, whether it's from commercial networks, whether it's from international, whether it's from citizen journalists? And then I'm going to cycle back to you on the same thing, David. But yep. you know, how do you view your mission, and how do you view the dangers and the and the profits? I mean, by international standards, as a very well-funded public service broadcaster, we have huge responsibilities to the creative industries in the country, and, and and indeed around the world, and we deal with them regularly. I was trying to decide. I was looking at the literature outside on the stands about the uh, complaints against big media, whether the BBC might constitute big media. And then I thought, actually, our whole country is the size of Illinois, so that can't be the case. We're more like local media, perhaps. But anyway, but nonetheless, we do have uh, a scale and income size that, that means that we have to work flexibly. I, I'd just say there's a very careful balance for us. We think uh, our visibility, efficacy, survival depends on having scale rights that we can ex uh, exploit nationally and then, to a certain degree, internationally. So we never want to get in the position of being pegged back to a sort of... Um, Cod Live Royal TV, you know, do, do the eat, eat your spinach, as you say, David, um, and then just procure content but not actually own the rights. We do want a strong in-house production arm. So 50, roughly 50% of what we make is produced uh, in-house. The other 50% we spread around the country. And, you know, the, the, a content budget getting on for $3 billion, that, that's a lot of money to spread around the country and create um, benefit for others in the industry. Um, I was just uh, reflecting on what David said about, um, you know, uh, the, the lack of, uh, let's say, reasonably paid career paths for journalists and, that, and how sad that is, because I think, I think you do need that. Uh, and certainly, uh, we're one of the last games in town in the UK. There are others that do it, but it's getting increasingly difficult. But having that depth, especially for international coverage, not just... I think everyone who's been in a, in a developing world country and you hear the radio and you're not quite sure whether you should believe the news report, it's the scariest feeling in the world. Mm -hmm. Having uh, a depth of journalism with boots on the ground, a vertically integrated model is very important to us, but it costs a lot. We must get good talent and pay them well. So that, again, is quite difficult when we have a government that says, well, you know, why are you paying these guys so much? They're just public servants, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's a difficult balance to strike. And I, uh, just the last note, I mean, uh, on, the, on the funding side, um, the idea that significant public funds to public service broadcasting uh, sort of compromises the product, that it therefore becomes government control, I think is just plain nonsense. Uh, we, we had, in our case, mechanisms that ensure that's not the case. We had uh, James Murdoch in town uh, about a year ago telling us effectively there was state media or there's commercial media, there can be nothing in between. If you're publicly funded, you must therefore be state media adopting the mm -hmm. state's position. And I hope we're the embodiment of the category in between and that everyone in this room uh, standing for public service, or many of you, public service broadcasting uh, and public service media are the embodiment of a, of a middle category that's very highly valued. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that I'm hoping to do with the project that I'm working on, which will be in the public radio space um, and will also be in the digital space, and it looks like, you know, right now we are going to have you know, terrestrial radio broadcast as well as digital content, social media. Um, I call it Pop and Politics Radio simply because I started a blog 15 years ago called Pop and Politics, and I don't want people to think it's the exact same thing, but I happen to own these domains, and they're just sitting around, so why not? Um, but I think increasingly one of the things that, that people are trying to deal with in public media as well as commercial is how do you still create something that has um, importance 
and something that can have a, uh, an effect of gathering a large audience while still recognizing that people want to interact with media in different ways, including having constant access over time, you know, being able to access the material 24 hours a day, either through you know, podcasts, streams, uh, you sure. know, online content. How do you deal, uh, David, I mean, when you, when you think about your mission now as Frontline has evolved, is your mission to create a flagship product which is sort of like a central gathering place for an audience or is it to create a panoply of offerings that keep people involved in different ways at different times? I think it sort of has to, in the future, I'd love to see it become both of those things. I think we do a flagship program and we get an extraordinary response. The commentary is deep and, and complex. Uh, thousands of people respond. The lines of commentary and reaction and debate and argument are quite vivid. Um, in addition, in several of our programs recently, what we did immediately on broadcast was to gather the people who had argued within the film and have them online seeing that film in real time and then responding to it immediately and putting another level of transparency what we've also done in terms of transparency from the very beginning was to run very deep archival records of the major interviews in all those films. And, those, um, and that's happened over many, many years to the extent that now people who write serious works of history go back into the frontline archives and, and, and dig deep into, the, into, that, in, into that material. That gives them a life much beyond the broadcast. When something like Bush's War uh, now has received over six million video views. It means that those films uh, are out there in the, in, 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 in the world for a long time. What I believe deeply in is the idea that our films should travel out from our website, that now even more so we can make these um, uh, embeddable videos that can move into the ecosphere so that even Rush Limbaugh picks up our film The Warning and sticks it on his website and gets 50,000 views right there. That's valuable to us. Um, the more and more we can push our content out um, and, 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 uh, and let it live beyond, I think, is part of our mission. And at the same time, in the making of these big complex works, there's an enormous number of ancillary, ancillary works that happen. And we haven't begun to really tap the, the depth of that material, the packaging, if you will, of them, the sharing of them, the, um, the, the additional work that can be done uh, both online and in radio as well around these major works. If we've invested deeply in what I call the bright line, which is the single narrative we've taken through the forest, we've also planted a lot, we've also found a lot of trees we think you should go and see. Mm -hmm. So we can help, uh, we can help in that editorial sense of being guides, but we can also at the same time be very, very open in the materials um, that we present. Um, there is a new uh, form that's emerging. Once a long time ago, I did a, a, a project on our website in the 90s, which I called a webumentary, which was a journey through 5,000 pages of the tobacco documents, the famous Brown and Nick um, Williams tobacco documents. It was a journey in three acts through the, the documents. Um, what we've done recently is with ProPublica, the investigative unit, um, and with the Times-Picayune, we've launched an investigation online and in print um, around the deaths in New Orleans in the days immediately after Katrina and the, and the police actions around those. The time of, and, and, we, and our reporter sits in the ProPublica investigative newsroom and films and shoots and posts video as we publish. In the two weeks after our website went up, we had three major breaks in the case. The website included uh, interactivity with the community, including posters that they could print and put up in shop windows with photographs of the crime scene and say, can you give us any more information about what happened here. Um, that is now becoming a documentary which will be broadcast on the fifth anniversary of Katrina, and that in turn will drive traffic back into that site. That's a living, continuing investigation that will continue. That's, not, that's only one we're doing. We're about to launch another one in a couple of weeks on uh, wo uh, wounded soldiers coming back and traumatic brain injury, which we'll do with NPR. And so the idea that these sites should be continuing journalism, 
that people should be engaging with them, that the commentary is very deep, is a part of, I think, the sophisticated kind of uh, thinking about what we do in public media. Do you ever worry that some of the ways in which you are engaging people in what you know is variously called you know citizen journalism, user-generated content, are going to lead you down uh, an alley and lead you astray? No. Why not? No, because I think we're in, we're journalists and we're editors and we test the material, the information we come to, and so we're not going to publish um, in in any unchecked way. Um, I mean, I think it's one thing to be publishing uh, cell phone videos of actual events in Iran because I think you can pretty much guarantee in the heat of the moment that that's you know that's true. It's you know it's it's not going to be faked at that point. Uh, you do take certain chances, but basically, essentially. Um, you're going to treat information as you would any kind of reporting that you do. You want to check the facts about it. If it's making an astonishing fact um, or a claim, you're going to have to get a second source on it. You know? so, uh, but I, I, I think that the public insight journalism, which is being developed in places like Minnesota and others, where you reach out to the community and look for expertise, is very interesting. So that you could say, join the public insight network, and if you were a former airline mechanic and you have expertise, I may be doing a story on maintenance at some point, and I sure could do with some extra information from out there, and you may have some of it. And I think you can get thousands upon thousands of people who can join with their expertise and become stringers, if you will, for a, for a larger journalistic enterprise. So I think that that's a kind of citizen journalism that we really could encourage and should encourage. You know, John, when when some people have looked at the possibilities for citizen journalism, um, they have seen what seems to be cheap and endlessly available content. You know, people shooting all sorts of stuff. And what it sounds like in this conversation is that to get the best out of expanding the role of the audience, you still have to do quite a lot of work. <laughs> I, I, I think Dang, that's right. Free lunch uh, gone again. Yeah, that's I, hard. So how do you deal with it? How uh, do you well, I, I, specifically I, I, at, at the BBC deal with it? I mean, l linking into the theme uh, I, I mentioned earlier, that tremendous promise of democratized access to media through new media and digital media, and you know, a thousand flowers of bloom and everything else. Uh, we have seen a lot of that, but I think we've also seen the triumph of, of and the staggering resilience of professionally produced. Content. You look at new t YouTube and the clips that gets most viewing now are, you know, increasingly professionally produced sample clips of mainstream programs and so on and so forth. So we've been very keen to build in uh, user-generated and contributed um, content around, you know, Twitter feeds, text messaging, all, all the sorts of things you'd expect. But at the same time, we've never wanted, you, you know, uh, to to, to um, uh, get too carried away with the prospect of it, and always keep in view the uh, you know uh, extraordinary effort required to produce globally resourced you know professionally validated news uh, 24 hours a day on the hour every hour so i think i think there's a balance as david was saying and it's important to recognize where it can enrich and add uh, i think the example of uh, trusted experts uh, in the community is a tremendously good one and that's something we've been doing uh, perhaps not as much as we should have done actually on that. Uh, more often we turn to the nationally accredited bodies to get the relevant expert where we perhaps could go more local and more community based. Um, but the early promise, I think, to the point has not quite uh, not quite been realized. And I think it's quite salutary for the policy uh, debates on the future of public service broadcasting and media. You do need a certain scale. You do need a certain uh, income. Uh, and the idea it can be pegged right back to just uh, you know uh, d doing the the, uh, uh, the Himalayan heights, the most virtuous things, and uh, leaving everything alone isn't isn't possible. Um, and that's that's been our experience and uh, uh, an, an approach. Yeah.